Hello and welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us today for Bruker Booth Ceramics 2020. I hope all is well with you and all is safe. Uh, we would certainly like to be with you in person in beautiful downtown Cleveland, but that's not going to happen. So here's the next best thing. We uh, come to you virtually and give you uh, some information that, uh, that we think is worthwhile. Um, so welcome again. My name is Sean O'Brien, Senior Sales Engineer for Bruker. I represent the uh, X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescence, and x-ray microscopy uh, instruments. I have three colleagues that I'm joined with today, Nathan, Julia, and David. We're gonna go through three nice presentations that will be of value to you. Our goal here for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour is uh, we don't want this to be salesy. We want this to be informative and you can take away some good stuff. Uh, so they're going to keep me on a short leash, which is always good. Um, before we get to the presentations, there's a couple of um, housekeeping things that we just want to get cleared up right away. Hopefully you can see the, uh, the housekeeping items. So um, you can manipulate your screen however you want. The layout, the engagement tools are... Um, at your discretion, however you want to organize your screen. Please let us know if you have questions. Um, during the presentations, we will field three to four questions per presentation. The overflow we'll do at the end. Um, so please type in your questions. Um, we have resources for you to download. There's some brochures, there's some app notes, there's some good stuff in there under the resource list. This presentation will be available in a couple days for you to download. Um, so as far as the ceramics market goes, we want to give you some, uh, some nice information today. Um, but before I pass it along to our our scientists. I just have a couple of slides that I want to go through. Um, so these are somewhat the family portrait of our X-ray diffraction instruments that are indicative of uh, what we sell into the ceramics market. Um, I don't have a little cursor tool, so I just kind of have to describe the positions. We'll start with the with the little guy, the 300 watt benchtop instrument, the V2 phaser. Uh, if you're doing good old fashioned Bragg Brentano divergent beam uh, powder diffraction, this is a nice instrument for you. Um, I would say that 70% of all folks, this is all the instrument that you would need. If you're doing high throughput, we graduate to the uh, the next instrument in line our D8 Endeavor, high-speed uh, throughput, pharma, ceramics, cement, geology. Um, and then we move on to our two big cabinet instruments, which uh, the only real difference is the enclosure, the real estate of uh, the size of the enclosure. If you want to look at multi-configurations uh, and more elaborate scattering techniques, then you move into the larger cabinet instruments. Obviously, the bigger instrument would house the bigger cradles, the bigger detectors, uh, bigger samples. And then um, this slide kind of depicts our family portrait of what we offer uh, uh, for X-ray fluorescence. The bottom uh, row uh, the middle guy is our S2 Puma, um, very popular instrument in the ceramics industry, 50 watt benchtop. Um, if your limits of detection are appropriate for energy dispersive resolution, S2 Puma, solids, liquids, slurries, powders, you name it. If we can throw it in a sample cup, we can measure it. Um, the top row, are our wavelength dispersive instruments. Um, top left 
is what Julia is going to talk about, so I won't steal her thunder. Um, the middle guy, top row, is basically our flagship instrument for X-ray fluorescence. It's our SA Tiger. Uh, you get to choose the motor, either a one kilowatt, a three kilowatt, or a four kilowatt. Um, four kilowatt obviously gives you the um, highest throughput, highest speed to result. Uh, the one kilowatt instruments, the nice feature about having a one kilowatt is there's no water chiller available. And if speed is your ultimate goal, then the top right is our um, simultaneous S8 Lion, 22 elements, um, two minutes start to finish, 22 elements of result. Um, and then the last slide that I'm going to do before I hand it over is um, our SkyScan um, X-ray microscopy instruments, David, is going to uh, talk about all of these. So uh, again, I won't uh, steal his thunder for this. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Nathan Henderson, our PhD scientist out of Penn State um, that has been with Bruker for seven or eight years or so. He's gonna give you a nice presentation on the structural analysis of ceramics. Nathan, are you uh, all set to go? Yeah, let's see, can you hear the audio okay? I can. I'm coming in, okay. Perfect. Well, um, thank you guys all for your time today. I'm excited to get to share a little bit with you about um, ceramic analysis. Uh, so as Sean mentioned, I work with the X-ray diffraction group. Um, so I'm here to give you just a little bit of information about what applications we see, particularly within the ceramics industry. Um, you know, basically what is X-ray diffraction and how do we see it applied? Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with X-ray diffraction, it is a scattering technique um, that relies on diffraction coherent scattering of a X-ray beam off of a solid material. And so what we see um, on this slide here is you'll get a set of peaks um, that have a finite position. So on the bottom axis used to be two theta. So this is the angle between your X-ray tube, your sample, and then your detector. So X-ray tube comes in, X-ray detector um, is the outgoing angle, and then between the two of them, you're gonna have a what's referred to as two theta. So it's a theta angle on the tube, a theta angle on the detector. And this is what we see plotted along the bottom axis. Um, this is inversely related to the distance between atoms and molecules within your material. So that's really what we're probing when we look at X-ray diffraction is the spacing of materials in a crystalline, um, in a crystalline phase. So what we use these peaks for, um, and what we care about is where are our peaks, so the peak locations in two theta or in spacing, um, the shape of the peaks, and then the relative intensities behind the peaks. And from this, we can use this as a fingerprint to do things like identify um, qualitatively what type of material do I have. So if I'm looking at a random white powder, um, this could be any number of different ceramic materials. It could be ground quartz, it could be calcium carbonate, it could be lime, it could be, you know, um, a rare earth oxide. But by looking at it with extra diffraction, each one of these materials has a unique fingerprint, um, a collection of peak locations and intensities that can be used to identify um, this material versus something else. Um, so that's usually one of the first things um, extra diffraction is used for is just sort of this qualitative phase identification. Um, beyond this, we can look at things like quantitative phase analysis. Um, like most analytical techniques, if you have more stuff, you end up with more signal. So as your peaks go up in intensity, you um, represent a larger fraction of your sample um, being represented by that phase. So if you had two different phases in here, um, the thing that you have more of, generally you see bigger peaks, the thing that you have less of, you typically see shorter peaks. Um, Microstructure and structure termination, we'll look at that here in another couple of slides, but just to give you a quick overview of what X-ray diffraction is used for and the types of data that we expect to see off of it. All right, so the first example that I wanna walk through with you is called polymorphism. So we're gonna look at polymorphism specifically within titanium. So um, titanium dioxide, very, very um, common material, uh, particularly if you're working in say the paint industry or any sort of like coatings. Um, 
And what we see here in the middle of the slide uh, is two different structures for titanium dioxide. So chemically speaking, these have the same chemical formula. So there is one titanium for every two oxygens. Titanium is going to be plus four. The oxygen is going to be minus two charge, so this charge balances. Um, we'll see very much the same short range order. So the titanium is going to be bound between six oxygens, as you can see in the middle. Um, but the long range order, um, the stacking of these, uh, the repeating units that we see. So I like to think about this as in putting a whole bunch of Lego blocks together and stacking them into different shapes. Um, we'll see the same thing for different polymorphs. So for titania, we see that um, on the left-hand side, this is anatase. So these will be um, stacked top to bottom. On the right-hand side, we see rutile. Um, this is stacked almost at you know, sort of an angle. Um, so despite the fact that the fundamental building blocks are still one titanium and two oxygens, we end up with different structures. And these different structures and these different connectivities give us different fingerprint patterns. So on the data in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide, what you can see is that we have um, a red pattern, a pattern that matches to a red set of sticks, and a pattern that matches to a blue set of sticks. So the uh, red pattern is going to be your major phase. Um, the blue pattern is going to be your minor phase. So there's a very, very small amount of, um, of, uh, of contribution from that. Um, so what we see is that our dominant phase, let's see if I can read this slide here, uh, is a rutile um, with about, this is going to be about a 1% impurity for the anatase. So particularly within the titanium industry, it's very important to be able to control which one of these polymorphs that you're, you're creating. Um, and this could be for specific um, optical properties. Um, you know, maybe one of these materials tends to, um, uh, one of the polymorphs tends to mask a little bit better um, in divisible regions. So you would need a little bit less of this pigment um, if you're trying to make a fully opaque coating, for example. Um, so on the right-hand side, what we see is the D8 Endeavor. Um, so this is our process automation defractometer. So you're going to have an x-ray tube. Um, the sample goes in the middle, x-ray detector on the backhand side. Um, this system is really designed for high sample throughput. So for industries like Titania, where you need to run a lot of samples and you're just trying to see, is my batch pure? Um, this would be something uh, you know, that would be useful for um, a site um, such as that. So, okay, let's see. Next, um, next example would be crystallite size analysis. So this is ceria, uh, so cerium dioxide. Um, so what we see here on the bottom left is two different patterns for two different samples of cerium oxide. So the same sample, same chemical formula, in this case the same structure, so the same polymorph. Um, however, you can notice that there are very, very distinct differences in terms of the peak shape. So the bottom one is a little bit broader, the top one is a little bit sharper, um, and I've done a little offset here on the y-axis just so that you can see this a little bit more cleanly. And, and what we see here is that um, the bottom pattern, which is broader, represents smaller um, coherent crystallite domains. So in this case, the bottom one is a sample of nanoparticles of Syria. Um, the top one is going to be um, more of a bulk powder that's been ground down. Um, so this is another example of how X-ray diffraction can really extract some useful information about your material's properties. Um, the smaller crystallites um, tend to have more surface area. So anything that is nanoscale or nanoscopic would be um, a little bit broader peaks. Um, so this can have effects on, say, catalytic activities, um, how quickly something oxidizes, um, how much surface area is there to bind to um, a specific moiety. Um, so useful information there. Um, that's not really related to the peak um, locations, but more related to the peak shapes. Um, so the system that we characterized these samples on was the D2 phaser. So this is our bench top X-ray defractometer um, shown here on the top right. Um, it represents a, a bench top system that is an all-in-one design. So everything is in this, um, this box is about a two foot, a two foot cube. Um, so the computer is integrated, the cooling system is integrated, um, the same components that you would see in our larger systems as far as the X-ray tube and the X-ray detector, um, but all of it has been miniaturized and um, made a little bit more compact for um, laboratories where you don't have a lot of space or um, you know, maybe there's not a lot of infrastructure and you need to be able to just plug this directly into um, one pin power or the wall outlet. So. Um, another example is non-ambient diffraction. So we're looking at data a little bit differently. So now what we're doing is we're looking down on top of the peaks. And as you see a brighter spot, this represents a bigger peak, a taller peak. 
So a more intense reflection is represented by a more intense um, color here. So this is a 2D plot. So what we're plotting on the y-axis is going to be temperature. So what we've done is we have set up this defectometer. So in the middle center, you see a little furnace chamber here, um, that big circular block. And we're able to heat up this sample all the way up, in this case, to 16. Um, so this stage goes up to uh, 1,600 degrees Celsius. Um, so we've made a little sample with a mixture of calcium carbonate or calcite uh, and TiO2, so anatase form of that. And what we're doing is we're probing the reaction mechanism for heating these two together. And as we heat up, what we see is that around 700 degrees, so right around the center of that plot, you start to see lime forming. So lime is calcium oxide. So this represents um, off-gassing the CO2 for the calcite. And once the CO for, uh, CaO forms, you start to see um, formation of this perovskite phase. So perovskite is uh, one of the more crustally abundant uh, minerals. Um, it has a very common structure, so CaTiO3. Um, I think Julie is going to be talking about this here in a little bit. Um, but it's a structural model for a lot of really interesting materials because you can substitute out the calciums, you can substitute out the titaniums, and um, really tune some of the electronic um, or chemical or you know, magnetic properties of this structure. Um, so we're able to probe these reactions um, in situ uh, at elevated temperatures. So it's a really, really neat experiment to do here. Um, the D8 Advance shown on the right is going to be that particular piece of equipment. Um, the D8 Advance is really designed to be sort of a, a modular design um, with a lot of flexibility in terms of what components you put on the center. So what types of stages you can have, what types of um, uh, processing you could do to your sample. You could do it with higher temperature. You could do it with lower temperature. Um, you could do this with um, you know, a capillary. Um, and then different options with regards to your optics and your detectors, which basically just change the way that the beam looks. Um, so you could have a very big beam, a very small beam, you know, one that focuses, one that um, is more like a laser. Um, so really, really cool uh, experiment, particularly with the ceramics industry, as you go to elevated temperatures, you really want to know what's going on um, as you're synthesizing things. Um, or, you know, say, for example, if we're looking at like a solid oxide fuel cell, um, what structural information do we get um, under operating conditions, which would typically be um, at elevated temperatures. Uh, final example here, um, doo -doo, I think it's final, but yeah, um, is going to be for battery materials. So um, here we are looking at in operando, so um, analysis of a pouch cell. So this is a single stack of cathode and anode material. Um, and we are doing charge and discharge cycles, so in operando while this device is operating. Um, and that's the data that we see down below. So similar to what we've seen before, but now what we're seeing is um, a diffraction pattern taken every three minutes. Um, so this is over the course of two full charge and discharge cycles. I think this represented about um, 16 hours of data collection. Um, and for those of you who are um, curious, uh, this data is included in an application note. So under your um, resources down at the bottom of your screen, um, you'll be able to download um, some of our brochures, some of our application notes, um, and relevant information. So if you're if you're if if this is something that's interesting to you or relevant to your research, be, um, be aware that you can download this um, during our, our event. So what we see here is that as we charge and discharge, we see these peaks start to move and then shrink and then move and shrink. And what this represents schematically is shown here on the left, so the top left, um, as the lithium ions get shuttled back and forth between the cathode and the anode, we see expansion um, to tolerate this extra atom. So these planes of these octahedra, these planes of um, metal oxide octahedra will get shoved apart a little bit. So as they shove apart, what you'll see is that your peaks will move to a larger spacing. So that's represented on the bottom by shifting to the left. So a smaller two theta angle represents a larger spacing. So as we charge or discharge, you're seeing the, the planes go away and then back together and then away and then back together. So this is what's happening, um, say, in your cell phone battery or any sort of lithium ion technology that you're using. Um, so on the right-hand side, we see this on our instrument. So this is our D8 Discover. Um, this is a very similar platform to the D8 Advance, just a little bit larger enclosure. And here we have the Iger 2 detector. Um, this is a very large detector. So what we're able to do is capture all of this data here that we see in one shot. So it's one shot, and in three minutes, you take another shot. In three minutes, you take another shot. Um, so for things like an operando diffraction or non-ambient, um, it's really nice to be able to get uh, these sort of large 
large sections of two data space um, very, very quickly. So um, with that, um, I think we have time for maybe one question here. So let me pull up the Q&A dialog and see if there's anything here. Um, all right, so we have a question. Uh, can the temperature 2D experiment be performed on the D2 phaser or just the D8 advance? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, there are temperature stages that are available for some benchtop experiments, um, but we find that these are very uh, limited in, in temperature range. So particularly for the ceramics industry, you often want to access much higher elevated temperatures. Um, and these have much more stringent power requirements um, just because you need, to, you need to provide a lot of power to the, um, the stage in order to get it up to those temperatures. So our strategy for um, non-ambient or elevated temperature studies is going to be on the D at advance, um, just because you get um, access to temperatures that are actually relevant. Um, so uh, say for ceramics, you probably want to, I mean, if we look back at our example here, you know, nothing really starts to happen until about seven or 800 degrees in this particular experiment. So um, you would need to, jack up the temperature. So the nice thing about the advance is that um, it is modular. You can switch this back and forth um, between, say, an ambient and then a non-ambient stage. And then as we go to higher temperatures, um, we would need to have room for things like additional cooling cables to keep the, um, the jacket of this um, ambient stage cool. Um, high voltage cables, um, maybe you want to flow in you know, some gas um, to keep things from oxidizing. So. Uh, typically, we see these on um, the D8 Advance or the D8 Discover platforms, just because of the spacing issue. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any other questions right now. Um, oh, we have another one coming in, but I do want to make sure we have time for the other technologies. So I'm going to hand this over to um, Julia. For those of you who have asked other questions of diffraction, um, please do stay on the line. We will be able to answer some of these at the end of all three of our technology presentations. So thank you for your attention. And um, without further ado, um, we'll pass this over to Julia for X-ray fluorescence. Hi. Uh, thank you, Nate. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so XRD and XRF kind of work together. XRD tries to figure out what structure something has. XRF tries to tell you what elements your sample is made of um, in the first place. Um, we did, and, and we have the option, as Sean showed you before, of like very large systems um, that use WDXRF, wavelength dispersive, and smaller systems, which um, use energy dispersive um, uh, fluorescence. So last year we introduced Essex Jago, which is kind of in between. So it is a benchtop system, but it is still a full WDXRF instrument. Um, the nice thing is that um, with those two configurations, you can either have something that you use just a few times, uh, maybe a week, then the simple um, single load is perfect. Or if you want to measure several samples at once, uh, you can load up to 24 samples here. Um, just to have a quick look inside, um, this system does not require specific power um, setup. You can just plug it in. Um, the elemental range goes from fluorine to, uh, to americum. Um, we have the long, lime ex long life time x-ray tube. And you can um, pick and choose what crystals you want to have. So this is basically a build your own. Of course. Um, if you want to go with a basic configuration, there are some benefits to it, but if you're just interested in one or two elements, then that is possible too. Obviously, it comes with the software, and it, we also have a standardless program for you available um, that comes with the basic configuration. Um, it, in comparison to other benchtop systems, like lower power systems, the 400 watt is also at the sweet spot. Um, it's not as high as the larger one kilowatt system, but it still gives you a lot more intensity than other smaller systems. We do mostly employ our systems in um, cement, spillings materials, um, metal industry, minerals, and mining. Also a sizable um, 
number of systems are in the pharma industry and also, of course, in academic research. And we do have quite a few applications for glass and ceramics um, and obviously petrochemistry and food and feed. So you can see that it's everything from low um, energy or like light elements up to very heavy elements. Um, sample preparation-wise, you have several options. Um, you can either run liquids, which in ceramics is probably not um, that applicable, uh, but you can also run them as powders. You can press them. You can fuse them. Um, you can even put in like kind of an odd-shaped sample if you want to, as long as it fits in here. There are certain advantages to putting a little time into your um, sample preparation, but overall, um, putting a sample in there will give you a result of what elements are present in your sample. The main advantage of using a WD system is resolution. So here we have an overlay of an energy dispersive system and the S6 Jaguar, and you can see that, um, for example, the K beta line of uh, potassium um, could be buried in, under the calcium K alpha line. Um, of course, all modern software can handle things like this, but it is better in the first place if you do not have an overlap that you have to correct for, especially if you don't have a lot of standards, for example. Um, another uh, overlap that I wanted to show you for like transition metals, you can see that with the S2 Puma, that's our energy dispersive system, um, you would not be able to um, to resolve that little manganese peak, but you can do that with the S6 Jaguar and obviously with our higher power S8 Tiger system. So the, the S6 Jaguar, the S8 Tiger are in, uh, wavelength dispersive and the S2 Puma is energy dispersive. Overall, these systems um, are as customizable as um, you wish. We do offer certain turnkey solutions. So for ceramics, I think you might want to, uh, you might benefit from something like GeoQuant, where we have 32 standards um, that that you can build a calibration curve from, and you don't have to think about where do I get these standards from. But overall, um, most customers like to build their own calibrations with standard materials that they either buy, like certified standard materials, or they make up their own. We also, as I mentioned, have a standardless calibration available. So um, you prepare your sample, you put in the information of how you prepared it, like the weight, um, if you pressed it, how much binder you used, or if you fused it. And then that way you can use the standardless calibration um, for either material identification, um, you can even make a very simple program that just tells you, yep, this is titanium, or no, it's not. Um, and it can also help you with um, unknown or new samples, or even if you have some kind of contamination somewhere, you can, um, or like some, something where you don't know what it is, you can try it to measure it. And the last thing is, if you get like high pure material in, you can use this very well to do contamination determination. Because ceramics is such a wide field, um, it, it, I, I couldn't really find uh, like the one example um, that uh, like, like Nate showed, but I want to show you that some samples that I measured. Um, so going back to SmartQuant, um, this measures scan, scans, so it does not measure peak and background, it measures a scan from where the peak and the background position are taken. Um, which means that the, the, the measurement program can handle whatever is thrown at it. Um, so here we can see the scan of calcium titanate, something that I stole from Nate's lab, um, which is 99% pure. And what I did, I prepared it as loose powder and as pressed pellet um, and measured it. And we can see the overlay here. So it's pretty much the same. Um, we can zoom in a little bit. Oh, not sure why it does not show the last one. Oh, here we go. So if we zoom in a little bit, you see the pressed um, one is the red line and the blue one is the loose powder. And we can see that at lower energies, we have a little more um, 
information from the press pellet, and we can also see that we see a little more oxygen with the powder sample. But going back to the results, um, this calcium titanate um, powder is supposed to be 99% pure, and if I do an evaluation, um, I can see that I get 99.35% um, of this matrix, and then I can also look at what other elements are present um, and can verify that with the peaks that I see. The second sample I want to show is a glass sample. It's a soda lime glass, and I used a certified standard material from NIST. Um, running this sample, um, on top we have the certified material, and on the bottom you see the evaluation with the S6. So this means you do not have to do any preparation, uh, not any preparation, you don't have to do any calibration, you don't have to put time into that. You just put your sample in there, you measure it, and you get a very educated guess of what is in your sample. Even very little uh, low concentrations like the 80, 70 um, ppm of zirconium oxide, for example. Um, I want to show you the, the scan real quick. We can see there's a high peak for silicon. Um, and then we can also see the zirconium up here, as mentioned before. So these are the two examples that I wanted to show. Um, ask me questions if you want to. I can see there's one question um, that says, how long does it take a pellet with 10% binder standardless measurement on the S6, which um, achieve these settings? You can put it together however you want to. The measurement settings I used took 20 minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes. Um, if you want to measure longer, so the system comes with two default settings. Um, if you want to get better um, statistics, you can measure it with one of the presets that's 45 minutes. But again, there are options of where you can put your own measurement method together. Um, at the moment, I think there are no other questions. Um, as before with Nate, if you have any questions, if you want to know more, oh, there's one. Uh, there's un one other question about these methods being destructive or not. No, they're not destructive. Um, so especially with the calcium titanate powder that I showed before. So you can put that in the system, measure it, and then you can reuse it if you want to. Um, if you have any other questions, um, please put them in there. Last question, now, how do you prepare liquid samples? Um, don't think. You can see it in the bottom left here. So there's a liquid cup. So it's a two-part cup, um, and you put a very thin foil in between, um, and then you pour your sample in there. There are several different foils available. Some are better for um, fuel. Some are better for water. Some are better for powder. So, so you have different options available. Um, I want to give my colleague Dave Samson now the option to, to speak, and I will be um, monitoring the, the questions that come in and answer them um, in, the, in the window itself, not, not verbally. So thank you for your interest, and um, let me introduce David Samson to you so he can take over and talk about X-ray microscopy of ceramics. Thanks, Julia. So my name is Dave Sampson. I'm the product specialist for the X-ray microscopy products. Um, I'm a, I'm most of you are probably unfamiliar with the X-ray microscopy products. It's not um, a something that's commonly, it's used all that common in um, ceramics, so it can be uh, used quite effectively. Um, X-ray microscopy um, is also known as... Um, CT, so um, computed tomography. Uh, much like a CAT scan you'd have for a human, this is a CAT scan geared toward material sciences. So unlike um, 
uh, a CAT scan for a person, they're looking at um, scale lengths of, say, 250 to 500 microns. We're down um, two orders of magnitude below that. So we're down at resolutions on the order of five microns or even with the nano CT systems down around uh, a few hundred nanometers. So what you have here is on the far left, you have uh, a capacitor and then you have a battery. Next one over is a ceramic filter. Um, and then the, uh, the next two are also uh, various batteries. So um, X-ray microscopy allows a three-dimensional, non-destructive analysis of your materials. So while Nate and um, uh, Julia told you you get the properties, what's it made out of, what's the material structure, the XRM gives you a three-dimensional connectivity of, of all your parts. So this works by basically taking thousands or hundreds to thousands of two-dimensional x-rays, then using something called um, back projections, you actually calculate out what three-dimensional structure could have generated all these two-dimensional images. So it's a very computer-intensive technique, but it's also um, very powerful. Um, like I said, it's two, it's, it allows you non-destructive three-dimensional analysis of your materials. Um, we have a series of products geared towards kind of what your samples are and what your needs are. Uh, the center one is our Skyscan 1275. That's our good all-purpose system. If you have lots of samples, um, you want to run them quickly or a user facility, um, this would be the way to go. The system on the left, now that's going to be your ultra high res or high resolution system. Um, so if you have small samples, but you want to look at, um, you want to get down into that uh, low single micron, that would be the way to go. And then for people that do things like additive manufacturing or you need a large sample, say you want to scan a bowling ball, then you move up to something like a 12, uh, the, the system on the right, which is a 1273. And all these systems work on the same principle. Um, they all have sealed source x-rays, which means that um, you never, there's no maintenance and they have a very low cost of ownership. And they're all very simple to use. Um, really, it's you take them out of the box, plug them in, and anyone can be trained in a few minutes. Um, and they will last for many years in your system. So um, what, what can you do uh, with an X-ray microscope? Well, lots of things. Um, I have an image, this is actually of a rock, um, but it's, it's a good um, analog for a lot of ceramic materials. You can get at things like relative density. So you've got three or four different materials. I can quantitatively tell you what are the material or how much of the materials are there. I can't tell you what's there. That's kind of Nate and Julia's job. But I can tell you if you have two or three components, how much of each is there. Um, you can get out of that with volume quantity as well, how much of each. Uh, so volume quantity is how much of each. Then relative density is how how denser than one of the others. The X-ray microscope works on um, atomic number and on density. So um, the more dense the material is or the higher the atomic number, the better it's going to attenuate X-rays. Um, orientation, say you have uh, anisotropic crystals in your material, you can actually calculate out the form of them, long axis, short axis, um, are they thick? Are they platelets? All this can be done statistically with the system. Thickness, say you have a layered material. I can now calculate out the thicknesses between the layers. I can give you thicknesses of layers. I can give you statistics of the layer thicknesses or statistics of the layers between samples. Um, defects, is my material continuous? Do there are voids? Do I have clusters? Do I have high density areas? Size, shape. Did I build the right part? Does it look like what it's supposed to look like? And in this sample, actually, I want to jump back is I have one material and the same analysis, I'm doing porosity as well as grain size analysis simultaneously. And I can plot all this out. Um, for those making filters, 
or porous materials. You can actually do measurements to calculate out the connectivity of your material. So you can make a porous material, but if the pores aren't connected, it's not really good for a filter. So we can actually calculate out the porosity of your material. Um, the, and this is just a short list. Um, X-ray microscopy is used extensively in um, oil, petroleum, the food industry. Um, you wanna know how many bubbles there are in your ice cream. It's done through X-ray microscopy. Uh, farmer, material science, um, additive manufacturing. These are all areas that have heavily uh, dove into X-ray microscopy. Um, Um, as well as being quant, you know, um, it, like I said, it's very powerful. This is a uh, 3D image that we took of a lithium ion battery. And um, you're able to cut section, um, show the different components, look for defects. Um, all this is done with, with all the um, existing software that comes with the system. Um, it makes, uh, like I said, this is a, a nice uh, uh, movie we made. Um, kind of shows you everything that the system is capable for. Let me run it through. Getting it, you can actually get a view from inside of your material looking out. Um, if you want to look at connectivity inside, say you made a, a part and you wanted to make sure that a passageway or a via makes it all the way through your system, this is one way of looking at that. Um, the, all the systems come with a complex um, suite of software um, because there's lots of different ways to look at your data and there's different ways to look at your data sets. The, this software package here is called nRecon. It's a proprietary package designed by Bruker and that's actually the software package that takes your two-dimensional x-rays and converts a three-dimensional data set. Um, we have some of the fastest, um, more, most accurate algorithms out there. There's all these algorithms to do this, but we've spent a lot of time and effort to make sure we do it fast and we do it correctly. Um, the next three packages, Data Viewer, CT Vox, and CT Vault, all look at your data in different ways. Um, data Viewer allows you to do two-dimensional slices anywhere within your sample set. When your sample set is generated, it's actually generated as a three-dimensional point cloud, just like a TIFF or a, an, an image would be a two-dimensional point cloud. You have an X, Y, and a grayscale. When you're looking at three-dimensional data, you have an X, Y, Z, and a grayscale. So CTVox is a, is a program that allows you to look at your samples in 3D, but still in the um, individual point cloud type data. And then if you want to generate three-dimensional solids and actually study surface or surface roughness or get into connectivity of different types of parts, you get CT Vol. And finally, um, CT AN is the analytical part of the software. It is a high-level program that allows you to do hundreds of various measurements, whether manually, automatic, you can create scripting. And going back to the 1275, which is our the center image out with the center system that I showed you, that system can be programmed so that if you have a part that you're using on a repetitive basis, you're always, you have a battery, you want to look at it every day or 10 times, 20 times a day, it can be set up with a push button so that the system automatically goes in, finds the right parameters, adjusts it for you know all of its best parameters, does all their reconstruction, goes all the way out into C10 where it can then run a script to go in and, and actually do the calculations that you're interested to do. So all of this comes with our um, independent, all this comes with our software packages. Our early software packages come with our system. Um, finally, um, Bruker has added this system uh, to the United States. We've created a new um, center of excellence, excellence lab here in Madison run by me. Um, up until this point, um, most of our demos have been handled um, outside of the country. So now all of the work that we will do will be in the U.S. And so um, we're able to run samples, do collaborations uh, locally.
And I think that covers my talk. I think I will. An I can answer any questions that I have. Let me see if there's any. Uh, can these pressure parameters be measured in the in nanomaterials? Tough. The resolution is going to be on the order of five to ten microns. So um, that. That is the kind of the order of magnitude we're looking at. Um, we have a larger system called the 2214, which will get you into the hundreds of nanometers. But if you're looking at nanometer part of the, you're looking at materials that have um, features in the you know 10 to 20 nanometers. No, that's not in the realm of X-ray microscopy yet. Um, no more questions that I see. Well, then, Sean, I will push it back to you. Hello? Sorry, was I mute? Um, <laughs> no problem, Sean. Yes. So thank you, David. Thank you, Julia and Nathan. Uh, I believe all of the questions are up to date. Uh, we do have some folks in the background also answering questions where where they can. So um, it does. Someone, it does look like we have a couple of more questions coming in. Um, so keep keep the chat rolling, you guys. If you have um, stuff that you'd like us to to answer. Um, yeah, we have got another thirteen minutes. Yeah. yeah, we've got about 15, 13 to 15 more minutes, so um, I guess what we'll do is we'll just go through, um, everyone take a turn, see what, uh, what questions have popped up. Um, let's see, for XRD, one of the questions that came in is um, talking about the diffraction planes moving during an, uh, an in-situ experiment, and this is actually intentional. Like This is, this is the core thing that you're measuring during um, an either in-situ or an in-operando. Um, study is what exactly is is happening structurally. Um, so for example, um, as I heat something, you, you start to see things expand a little bit, right? Um, or as you're doing a charge or discharge study, um, you start to see certain planes um, compress or expand because of the, uh, the shuttling of atoms um, back and forth. So it's an interpolation. So basically, you're, you're expanding the spacing of several atoms by shoving another one in between them. Um, much like if you're on an elevator and you need to fit one more person in, um, everyone has to kind of shuffle away from each other. So, uh, you know, that's, that's actually the whole core of why you would, you would do that. Um, let's see. Uh, Julie or Dave, do you guys see a question that you're, you're eager to answer? Um, someone asked me about the what is the uh, minimum size that I'll be able to scan in in my material for an X-ray microscope, and I kind of um, addressed that a little bit. That um, most of the X-ray sources that we use have a spot size of about three to five um, microns, so that kind of limits your resolution, um, and it gets kind of convoluted with um, XRM. Um, you have uh, the um, spot size resolution, you also have the pixel size resolution. So um, say on my 1272, I have a pixel size resolution of <clears throat> in the hundreds of nanometers, so two, 300 nanometers. So I can make, I can get a, my pixel size that's small, but my, my ultimate resolution is only on the order of five nanometers or five microns. So I can put 10 pixels onto that individual five microns. But then if you want to see something, getting back to, you know, what is what is the resolution of an of a defect that you could see, now you're on the orders. I, I want to put two to three pixels or two to three, um, you know, spot sizes. So you're looking at five to ten microns um, as far as what is the smallest feature I'm going to say I actually have. So... Um, Someone I, wanted to know what the – yes, go ahead. Oh, I just – I thought you right. you were done, but I can give you more time for the for the last question you wanted to address, and then I'm going to go through yeah, two yeah, more questions I got one that I more. Had. Let me address it. Um, 
someone asked what's the difference between micro CT and nano CT. And it's really the XRM, nano C, XRM and micro CT are used interchangeable. We consider the term CT the technique, whereas um, XRM, X-ray microscopy is the instrument. So I'm doing X-ray microscopy using micro and nano CT techniques. So they are basically the same thing. So go ahead, Julia. Um, yeah, I had two more questions that might be interesting, or three. One was if we can um, detect zirconia and um, yttrium at the same time. Yes, that's possible. They're, the resolution is fine. Um, the other question was if it's possible to measure light elements. And as I mentioned before, the, the range for the for um, XRF on the X6 Tiger is fluorine and upwards. Um, if you get a higher power instrument, you can go down lower, but the lighter an element is, the more it doesn't fluoresce, but it uses a different um, physical process um, if it gets excited by X-ray radiation. Um, so that's the reason why no matter which system you use, which XRF system you would use, you have certain limitations with light elements. However, you can measure light elements um, if you set them as a balance. So if you think you have a sample that has drawn moisture, you could measure it by um, measuring it with a standardless program and then setting H2O as the matrix. And it does give you a pretty good idea of how much moisture would be in your sample. The other option is that um, you can also, if you know light element information, for example, you've burned it and you know how much CO2 burned off, for example, you can enter this into your um, evaluation and that way you can make your evaluation even better because then the software can take this information and apply it while it's going through its evaluation cycle. Um, that's the two things that I wanted to answer because I thought they were interesting. So, yeah, and oh, I think one thing, one more to, thing. Um, to also point out, so on the live view right now, you do have our uh, contact information. So we are coming up on the end of the hour, but um, if you have any questions whatsoever about um, applications of these technologies within um, your research or uh, production space, please do feel free to, um, to contact us. More than happy to um, point you in the right direction get you in touch with some literature or put you in touch with whoever your local sales rep is. Any other questions? I think we will wrap that up. Uh, thank you so much for logging in and attending. We really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully next year we will be with you in person. Um, until then, please let us know what we can do for you. Um, uh, again, our information is on the slide if you need to reach out to us. So at this time, we will end the podcast, and uh, we thank you again. Bye-bye.